And he just brought me this book that Ken Ham himself is publishing called Inside the Nye Ham Debate. <laughs> and it's autographed for Bill. I'll read it to you. Here's earnestly hoping you find the way, all caps, someday you would be welcome to the world of the redeemed, which is, means he's in what world now? <laughs> the unredeemed? We can celebrate the creation together. John 14, 6. They just can't stop quoting scripture even in a book signature. <laughs> Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Ken Ham, January 6, 2015. Well, okay, he's a good sport about it. But, uh, so we're also going to talk a, bit, a little bit about that today. And then uh, we're going to do a, a little in conversation here about books. Uh, Bill's really important book, Undeniable. We have a, quite a few copies here. So after the in conversation, we'll take some of your questions at the two microphones here. And then when we're done with that, you can line up here and come on stage to get your uh, signature on, your, uh, on Bill's book and get your selfie with him or whatever it is you want to do on that. And uh, so with that, uh, of course, you know, uh, you wouldn't be here in such droves if you didn't know who Bill Nye the Science Guy was. But you should also know, just in case you're not uh, aware of this, that he is the uh, executive director of the Planetary Society, the largest private planetary society uh, in, the, in the world. And, um, you know, they're really doing some important things about, uh, you know, the future is, uh, of humanity is in space for sure. And, and we need a lot of advocates for that. So that's Bill's day job. They're right here in Pasadena. And uh, so he splits his time here in New York doing a lot of television work. And uh, so with that, of course, help me welcome Bill Nye, the science guy. Thank you. Greetings. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Woo. Greetings. Oh, I love you, man. Well, I haven't said anything yet. No, it's great. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow. Wow, you're my people. Uh, any questions on what we've covered so far? <laughs> so, uh, so here, let's just turn this on. This whole thing started, and by this whole thing, um, I mean, uh, uh, here we go. Yeah. Uh, with a thing I did on Big Think. And I don't know if you've, the kids, the young people, you probably know the Big Think. Uh, it's so on the electric computer <laughs> that the kids use. And uh, I made an offhanded remark. I was t I'd gotten there. I, got I was in New York City, so I had to be, I had to get up at 5.30, which is 2.30, you know, Western time. And I was tired, not that it, but I, I wasn't disciplined, perhaps. But it was heartfelt. I said, don't let your kids grow up to be creationists, because we need them to solve problems. Uh, no, we, no, I'm not joking. We need young people to go to Caltech and develop the better, better way to desalinate seawater without using so much energy so that we can have a better future for all humankind, raising the standard of living of girls and women so that uh, the human population naturally decreases, and so on. <clears throat> well, but <laughs> thank you, thank you. But just notice, as of yesterday, almost 7 million views. In other words, there's 7 million people who've got nothing else to do. <laughs> Watch this. And uh, along that line, uh, I did this debate with uh, Ken Ham. Now, he, got, he heard about this from Big Think, or his people, his staff, heard about it from Big Think. If you don't know who Ken Ham is, he's a preacher. He's in the... He's a, a minister that has a ministry, he calls it, called Answers in Genesis, which is in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, and he's Australian. And are there any Australian people here? Really? <laughs> How about anybody who naturally has a British accent? <laughs> I mean, for real. Yeah, there you go. Do you find that people from the U.S. think you got like you know more than the rest of us because you got a British accent? Yeah. So I often wonder, full disclosure, by the way, I just noticed that's Liam Kennedy, who is a big, strong supporter of the Planetary Society. Way to go. Uh, tomorrow in the New York Times will be a big announcement. And uh, Liam is going to be, I hope, intimately involved with the near future. It's going to be huge. It's going to be so huge. <laughs> so, okay, so 
answers in Genesis, Genesis finds out about this, they write me a letter, we go back and forth, we agree on a debate topic. Is, uh, is uh, creationism a viable model in today's scientific world? Viable was the key word. And you know, of course I'm saying, well, no. But um, <laughs> as of last night, 3.9, almost 4 million views. Now it's been online less than a year, whereas the other uh, big thing thing has been on uh, two years, two and a half years. So I don't know, how many people saw this or heard about it? Yeah, I love you guys, I love you. So I think I made some points that were very strong. Uh, and his were not especially. Uh, but I just want you to know why it's important, or why it's important to me. It wouldn't matter if we had some extraordinary people who live outside of the mainstream and uh, consider this a religious business that they're in, and they really are out to save people and spend their intellect and treasure doing that. But understand that really at the, in the back, or the basis, or the thing that they work very hard at, at Answers in Genesis is indoctrinating young people, indoctrinating science students. These look like science tests, right? You get the Tyrannosaurus, the Stegosaurus, here's electricity, a clumped particle, a changed particle, the potential in uh, circuits with multiple paths. For This looks like science, right? There's an AND gate, an AND gate, so on. But in the back of all that, and the Earth is 6,000 years old, which is uh, not true. So just to give you an idea, this is a news story that ran in the Louisville, on Louisville, tele, or I guess Cincinnati Television, uh, just a few weeks ago. And they got this kid coming into the, they, he has a facility, a building there, called the um, Creation Museum. Now, for me, a museum has artifacts, right? It has things from the past that you would rec that you go, wow, that's really the chair that, uh, that uh, Edwin Hubble was sitting in? Have you guys ever been to Mount Wilson? I was there, yeah, with a guy named Frank Jastrow, is kind of a character. And uh, yeah, Bill, uh, the cell phones don't work very well here. There's a pay phone over there, and uh, I, I like Coke. There's a Coke machine, and that's the chair that Hubble was sitting when he discovered the Big Bang. Anyway, uh, it's, it's like, it's like, what did you say? What, dude, what did you say? It was quite a moment. It was the, the science guy show days. But uh, in this museum, there are no artifacts. It's just robots and stuff. You may not have known that dino ancient dinosaurs were all vegetarians until 6,000 years ago. And so if you got a kid, look at his face. He's like excited. Wow, that's really cool. This, my parents believe this. This is really great. But it turns out it's really not right. But the next day, all over the internet, the electric internet the kids use, uh, was this picture. And just to tell you, this is from Tennessee, but it's just a few, it's not far south of where, I mean, if you really wanted to go, you, it's no trouble to get there from this uh, county. And just look at this car. It's a family vehicle, and it has a clear depiction of, uh, I mean, it's, they got a lot of Bible quotes. But they also, I mean, it's probably, you know, for kids and soccer moms and stuff like that. So when you're raising children with this, that's when I claim it's not in anybody's best interest. Because we're going to have serious, serious problems in the coming decades with climate change, and we need as many scientifically literate voters as possible, scientifically literate <clears throat> citizens, and especially engineers, to change the world. So... Um, the whole thing was really crystallized for me by a question that came from the audience. What, if anything, would ever change your mind? And I don't know if you guys, how much of the debate you were able to sit through, but <laughs> seriously, I mean, it was, you guys, you know, I'm an actor, and you really, had, you really had to concentrate. I mean, he was, Ken Ham says really extraordinary things that are completely out of, I mean, how is to describe it? They're ludicrous. And uh, he uh, just keeps going. And so as you may recall, I went, oh, well, if we found one fossil swimming between the layers in the Grand Canyon, frozen in time, trying to escape the big, or if there was some way to get giant boulders on top of the ground in Washington State and Oregon, uh, not caused by an ancient flood, but by some deity who thought they belonged there, 
if you had some way to get light from stars which are more than 6,000 light years away here in less than six, if you had that figured out, you know, then we could take a meeting. But his, his thing, if you recall, was, I have a book. I have a book. And that was, that was the end of it for him. And I found out later who wrote the question. Um, it's a gal who um, does Friendly Atheist, Teresa Moody. It was really cool. So I met her at Vanderbilt University several months later. It was really, really cool. Uh, but anyway, that really was the thing. This is from their Answers in Genesis website. And it just, you may, some in blue, you might recognize Dwayne Gish, who was famed for doing the Gish Gallop, where he introduced one thing after another, one thing after another. And it's, I know it's hard to read things in, an, in a room like this, but um, Bill Nye's tactic even mentioned that he was to throw a bunch of data at Ken Ham, knowing that he would never have time to respond. Uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, it wasn't really a bunch of data. It was sort of a series of arguments that, you know, if you have, if you have uh, a snow cycle and a summer cycle every year in, say, Greenland, so you get a layer of ice, and there are 170, I mean, uh, over 600,000 layers of ice, then in 6,000 years, you need 170 snow winter cycles, which didn't happen. Somebody would have noticed that, you know. But the one that, my favorite one here is elephant hurling. I really, Bill Nye's debate strategy was nothing more than elephant hurling. <laughs> okay, is there anybody from South Africa? From, I've, I have spent time on television, I admit, really close to elephants. I, don't, I just don't see how I would hurl them. So I'm, I'm gonna write to him and ask him what that's about. Then the, <laughs> so, the other thing I was gonna say is we have an extraordinary number of climate deniers here in the US. And so if you're from Anywhere else in the world, your government, your citizens are, in, at least where I've traveled, I'm not like, I'm sure a few of you in here, but I've been around the world a little bit. Everybody talks about climate change. This is what they talk about. This is what they're worried about. This is what they're concerned about. What are we going to do about climate change? Negotiating with climate change. And especially, what are we going to do about the United States and climate change? That's what people talk about. No, really, in the rest of the world. And so along with this, Ken Ham is a climate change denier. So he is raising... A, as many people as he can, uh, raising the idea, introducing the idea that climate change is not real. And so this is dangerous. I mean, it wouldn't, at some point, I admit, I, I thought it was charming that <laughs> these guys can live, can live their lives using this extraordinary technology, but completely out of touch with how it all got here. But he's actually, you know, this is leaving the world worse than you found it. So I just want to talk some more about me. Uh, <laughs> I go back, I just want to point out that I go back with climate change over 20 years. I've been talking about climate change for over 20 years, and, uh, but Bill, it's still a problem. You failed, I know, uh, I have, but I, just for the record, I, I go back a long way on this. Now, Ken Ham, this is back when, you know, Pierce Morgan, if you remember this guy, he uh, was a very well-respected newscaster from Britain who, had, who has a real British accent. And uh, he, ha he was taken off the air because he would not stop talking about uh, gun violence in the United States. He just wouldn't let go. Anyway, but before that, I was on his show right after the debate. And this is the moment where I, I Ken Ham denied denying climate change after... Pierce Morgan asked him about it, and I just like this one freeze frame where you go, actually, you gotta tell you, you're, you're denying what you don't, de what you're already denying. So it just gotta stop you right there. And uh, that night, it snowed like crazy in Cincinnati, and we drove back to the hotel with a couple of Answers in Genesis security people, and they have the curly thing, you know, the Secret Service earpiece in, and they, did not say a word. We're an hour and a half in the car. They didn't say a word. Because they, you know,
can we say ass here? Uh, I, I, you know, I kicked, I kicked their boss's ass, and so they were in the, there they were. So uh, just keep in mind that, the, uh, we'll sit down in a minute, but the Answers and Genesis people have not let up. They have, they have a lot of technology, huge Facebook presence, huge Twitter thing. Uh, I guess I haven't checked, but I'm sure they have Instagram, Snapchat, and all that going on. And they're advertising for a programmer. And uh, there's a job opening, a job number 109. Visual Studio, for those of you familiar with some software, familiar with Agile, Scrum, and uh, Plus, experience with, uh, is a plus. Experience with SQL uh, servers, 2008, and is a plus. Apply for this position. And when you do, you have to have a proven firmness in one's walk with Christ. Thessalonians, some of the, the heart of servant that works diligently and seeks to defer. Okay. Just a couple things here. <laughs> First of all, when in this debate, I am, I'm not an expert on the Bible, as I'm sure you're aware, but it wasn't that flood and everything in the Old Testament? Wasn't that before Hayes, uh, Jesus showed up? I mean, he keeps tying that in. I mean, just let me say theologically. But the other thing is they very much hope to get tax dollars from uh, Kentucky, the Commonwealth of Kentucky, to support their Ark Park, which is the new museum, and uh, museum, a new facility. It's gonna be a replica of Noah's Ark. Yeah, sure. You can buy a plank and stuff, and so they will be taking tax credit from the Commonwealth. And along with this, here's a clearly religious method, uh, message. You cannot be gay, you cannot be homosexual, and apply for a job there. So this is, to us, on the outside, a clear violation of the Constitution. And so you'd expect it to get, you know, short shrift. But they are pushing forward. They are not letting up, man. They really believe that they're, uh, they have the right idea. And so the billboards are up on the main freeway uh, around Cincinnati. Thank God you can't sink the ship. And they're, you know, they're fighting the fight. They put this, in other words, they're spending the dollars from their constituents or parishioners or from the ministry members to put up billboards like this. Here in the United States, where people invent iPhones and make 787s and get Nobel Prizes in chemistry, we got these guys doing this. It really is a remarkable thing. And to those of you who might not be from the US, I don't get it either. Uh, <laughs> So, anyway, uh, this, is their, this is from their website just a couple days ago. And they believe, they, what they have is pitching everybody else in the world as their enemy. So, uh, to this end, I was writing a book about climate change for St. Martin's Press, which is, I'm just telling you, it's a real company. Like, <laughs> you know, it's not Bill just messing around with his HP printer. It's like... <laughs> It's like a real company. I'm writing a book about climate change. And after that debate, which I thought would be, you guys, seriously, I thought it'd be a college gig, which I enjoy. I thought I'd go to college, a, a campus, we'd do some tweeting. You know, it'd be fun. A few people would show up and then we'd move on. It's got four million views and the thing that led to it, seven million views. And so the publisher insisted that I write, that I change what I was doing. And so I wrote it in last spring. And look at this guy, man. He's, he will mess you up, all right? He's like, he's serious. I don't know, not really sure how we got that picture. Uh, it was in a photography studio in New York City. Anyway, along this line, you guys, I don't want you to feel ripped off, okay, for those of you who bought my book. I used to work on a drawing board. I, I mean, I used to have a job, all right? I used to be a productive member of society. <laughs> and uh, I made sketches for the book. And I thought they would hire like real, you know, sketch person, <laughs> woman, guy, person. But no, we'll just put them in just like that. Whoa, okay. <laughs> so anyway, for you controversy buffs, I have decided that the Vera, the viruses, deserve their own domain of life. And I'm sure there's a few of you who are gonna get in a fist fight with me about this because, but whatever it is, the viruses I don't think are concerned uh, with how we 
<laughs> ring them up. But um, the importance of this can't be, or not the virus, but the importance of evolution can't be overstated. And people say, well, Bill, what do you know? You're, an, you're a mechanical engineer. You're a kid's show host. What do you know about evolution? And my answer is, enough, OK? <laughs> What's in the book, it's a primer. It's a primer on evolution. And it's these fundamental ideas that I feel everybody should know about. And when it comes to things that affect public health especially, uh, I just want to remind you all that Ebola is a result of evolution. We would not be dealing with this if uh, viruses and, and bacteria didn't change with time. So with that, I just want to thank you all very much for coming. And now Michael will grill me with some insightful questions. Thank you very much. You want to sit over here? So we might start with the, uh, uh, what's the, what's the story? Oh yeah, so, so I was riding my bike. What was I doing? My business. And um, I have, you guys have a level in life where I have a publicist, okay? He calls me on my bicycle. I feel the phone vibrate. Okay, call him. So ABC wanted to do a story about inflation gate or deflate gate. Deflate gate, yeah. yeah deflate gate. So if you haven't heard the story, hey, look, okay, you can, you can hate football. You can hate the principle of it. You can hate people, you can hate athletes, you can hate me, you can hate everything, all right? But the Super Bowl is a big deal, all right? <laughs> and, and I say that financially, it's, a, it's an important thing, right? So apparently the New England Patriots have routinely, or at least recently, kept the balls a little bit, footballs, a little bit, <laughs> less inflated than is regulation by about 15%. So I, rode, I was on my bike, I was on Mulholland Drive, I rode home and uh, got a couple of balloons and put, with a, with a Sharpie, I put uh, laces on them and showed that it's easier to grab a smaller object than a big one. And by the way, this ruse or this, um, this rule bending was discovered by a defensive player from the Indianapolis Colts who caught who intercepted a ball. He's not the guy intended to catch the ball. And he says to the referee, what do you think, man? And so they realized that New England had been underinflating the ball. So watch how easy they are to grab. Just show you, see when you can squeeze it, you know, then you can like catch it one-handed. And so this is a breaking of the rules, it's cheating. New England uh, overwhelmed Indianapolis in that game. But you gotta wonder if it wouldn't have been different if they hadn't been so demoralized in the first half, blah, blah, blah. And then, full disclosure, you guys, okay. I, out of engineering school, I got a job at Boeing. I worked on 747. And I lived in Seattle for 26 years. <laughs> and what I always say is I was in Seattle when Seattle came of age. I don't wanna, I, I know there are Yankee fans everywhere, but in 1995, the Mariners beat the, Mar I'm sorry. <laughs> The Mariners are a baseball team. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, beat the New York Yankees, and it was a big deal. And now Seattle, you know, has this reputation for having a 12th man on the field, which is the crowd. The, the city is so insane for this football team. So I just had to tell ABC News, go Seahawks! <laughs> yeah, so now, you guys, for you drama buffs, now we have this uh, dynasty team, the New England Patriots, who've won three times and almost six times, and we have this underdog team, the Seattle uh, Se Seahawks, and now not only that, the dynasty team is a villain. They're cheaters. <laughs> so uh, at least watch the first half. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Michael, there's more to it than that, I take it. Well, we want to talk about your book, but I thought we'd go back in time a little bit and, and just talk about how, how Bill goes from Bill the, the engineer at Boeing to Bill Nye the science guy. And, 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 uh, and what was it like to be the student of Carl Sagan? So everybody, I took one class from okay, Star one class. Carl Sagan. <laughs> no, but it's not insignificant. I took one class, solar system, 102, because I satisfied all my engineering requirements and I could take electives. So I was a senior in college, I took a freshman course. 
And by the way, you know, I went to Cornell University, which is a very well-respected school, but how the how in the world did I get into Cornell University? I mean, these people are so smart. And I was just like, oh, cool, I go to astronomy class, great. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, the guy was all that, as the kids say. He was quite the lecturer. He's really influential. And the paper I wrote for him, I got an A on from Steve Soder, who was Carl Sagan's uh, grad student, grad to postdoc or whatever it was at that time. And for you, if you're scoring along with us, Steve Soder was one of the writers on the remake of Cosmos. So he was a writer on the original Cosmos and the new Cosmos with Neil deGrasse Tyson. So. Uh, he pointed out to me the other day that I remind him that he gave me an A every time I see him. <laughs> he gave you the A. Well, he awarded yeah. me an A. Yes, yes. I earned an A because I wrote a paper about Curlian photography. Does anybody remember this? Mm -hmm. With digital cameras, you may not, this may not be as uh, fresh in your conscious, but uh, there was a technique where charlatans would take your picture with a Polaroid usually, and then while they took the, picked the, the um, film out of the camera, they'd smith it with their thumb and hand it to you, and then you would get this cool color aura around your head. And that was one very popular technique. And then there's also a thing called, just in physics or in science, called a corona discharge. It gives off sparks, either visually uh, optical sparks or just an electric field that will influence film. So you can zzz, you can zzz the film and it will, Film, I'm sorry, uh, film. <laughs> uh, um, it was a technique for capturing photographic images. Uh, so it's, it's, it's Chemicals, Don't worry about it, it's a long story, obviously. <laughs> but anyway, and the guy, is for astronomy class, for a class of nominally about the solar system, I wrote a paper about skepticism, about critical thinking. And that was Carl Sagan's big idea. Mm -hmm. uh, the critical thinking is the most, or your ability to think critically is a much more important skill than the facts of astronomy. And I, that made quite an impression on me. And then I was in Seattle uh, and a new group of friends, I moved total strange, I didn't know anybody in Seattle, I got off the plane and just wandered around. Because you got a job at Boeing? Because I, I was recruited. By the way, okay, everybody's taught, okay. <laughs> Everybody's talking about how college education isn't worth it. It's not a good value. It, costs you for, it takes your whole life to pay it back. People, if you get a degree, if you get an engineering degree, you'll get a job. <laughs> all right? I mean, it's a, I'm sorry. I love you all, and I love the history of art. I'm crazy for it. <laughs> but it's an investment. I mean, you're spending that kind of money, learn to think, but also get a skill or two, you know. So uh, anyway, a group of friends, a new, newly forming group of friends, mostly at a bar called the Rain Tree, uh, pressured me to enter the Steve Martin lookalike contest. <laughs> and, and I won. I mean, I won. Of course. And, well, I don't really look like it. My, my claim, and this is an extraordinary claim, you can evaluate, that I understood what Steve Martin was driving at uh, better than the other contestants. And so I won. I did not advance beyond that. Uh, that you mean was, com comedic wise? No, no. Uh, there, that, you went in Seattle, then you went to San Francisco, then you went to, uh, I guess, New York. Maybe it was Los Angeles for the final. And the guy who won was from Nashville. He could play the banjo. I mean, and also, I got to say, he kind of looked. <laughs> um, anyway, he, he came out. As Steve Martin on Saturday Night Live, he opened the show, oh. the fake guy, and it was cool. I've never crossed paths with him in all that time, but anyway. But hosting Saturday Night Live would be cool. That's a goal, I admit. <laughs> they haven't had a science guy, do God, they? God, I, I, I've said this to, I'll say it to all of you, I would love to host Saturday Night Live. <laughs> I would love it. And... Let me just, I don't know if the producers are here, they certainly <laughs> should be, but you know, Saturday night has changed a little bit the last couple years. They used to have a real fish out of water quality, right? They'd have an actor or actress who wasn't used to doing comedy, or they'd have uh, somebody from the news world and he or she would then be... Sports. Sports, yeah, would try, like trying to, yeah, sports. Trying to deal with these people who are professional comedians. 
But now they have real actors, people who are really in the business doing it. Well. Yeah, so my claim is I'm on the border. <laughs> that I bring this other stuff to it. None of these guys are out there talking about deflating footballs. Come on, this is important stuff. This is serious business. <laughs> but still, the guy's cheating. It's frustrating. And by the way, Belichick, the, the coach, you can hate football, you hate everything you hate me, I understand. <laughs> but just keep in mind, the guy was also fined half a million dollars for uh, stealing the other guy's plays, which is completely, mm -hmm. they had some illegal video camera in the practice stadium. There's all these, I mean, it's, you know, it's billions of dollars, literally, by the time the whole season's done, changing hands. So, you know, cheating is, I mean, something to be discouraged. <laughs> so you're working at Boeing. Oh, yeah. And uh, you, have, you, have, you have some... Uh... So I worked on a drawing board, you guys, one of the last guys to work on a big drawing board, making little lines and things carefully. And, uh, and then I won the series. Then I started doing stand-up comedy. Then I met guys who were starting a comedy show. This is, in my opinion, it was when Steve Martin became that huge that every city in the U.S. and Canada suddenly had a comedy club, mm -hmm. you know, just like in an afternoon. And so, you know, I met Jerry Seinfeld and on, the, on the circuit, and I met... Uh, uh, a lot of A. Whitney Brown, if you remember, used to do it. I hope someday to be the Whitney Brown. He was really good. Uh, I mean, you're doing normal stand up, like what's with airline peanuts kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah. right. Except they're all hilarious, brilliant engineering jokes. <laughs> <laughs> and really good. Hey, you're an engineer. And, you know, they could tell. <laughs> Hey man, can you fix the blender? <laughs> if you're at a party. <laughs> yeah, so, sure. I'm an engineer. Um, uh, hold the plug in the wall firmly <laughs> and then put the blender under some cold running water. <laughs> and that's only funny if you're scientifically literate, okay? It's, <laughs> so, and see how. And so that's why I never made it, Michael. <laughs> I middle, if you guys know this, I don't know if you're into this. There's the headliner, the middle, and the, the headliner, the middle, and the MC. I middle for a middle. little while. Yeah. But I never made it to headliner, those guys. Well, that's good because we got you as the science guy. Yeah, I know. So then I worked on the comedy show, and one week, the way one guy remembers it, it was Geraldo Rivera who, wouldn't show, who didn't show up. But the way I remember it was it was Rita Jenrette. Oh, right. Does anybody remember Rita yep. Jenrette? Yep. So she was notorious for having had sex on the steps of the U.S. Capitol. And she wrote a book about it. She became a Playboy model at, uh, afterwards. But here's the weird thing. I mean, the really, I won't say troubling, but let's say surprising thing about it. The guy she was having sex with was her husband. <laughs> I mean, have you ever heard of such a thing? Who does that in Washington, D.C.? It's crazy. Right. Yeah. I, just, I didn't know they rolled that. I didn't have any idea. Anyway, so she didn't show up. We had to fill six minutes, which I'll tell you, in television, it's a long time. I mean, if, we, if he and I sat here and didn't say anything for six minutes, you'd notice. You'd like... <laughs> uh, <coughs> yeah, even three seconds is a little much. Yeah, so... Hey, Bill, you know, you're all, why don't you do that stuff you're always talking about? So I was a young guy. I was a United Way big brother volunteering, and I volunteered at the Pacific Science Center, which was like the California Science Center in Seattle. And I pour liquid nitrogen around and stuff. So you could do that stuff you're always talking about. You could be, you know, like, uh, this is a guy named Ross Schaefer, who's the host of the show. You could be like um, Bill Nye the Science Guy or something. Well, I got to go. <laughs> and I went, Bill Nye, the science guy, that's fantastic. <laughs> so I did the household uses. Study. Study. I did the household uses of liquid nitrogen. You know, because <laughs> we all have it around. You know, and I had limp celery and but bananas. <laughs> yeah, but I had onion. If you got get an onion cold enough, hit it with a knife, it just it sounds like breaking glass. It's really satisfying, really good sound. <laughs> But then the thing that I still do, I mean, not every day, but from time, is you freeze uh, marshmallows and eat them and steam comes out of your nose, which is really good. It's really good. And uh, so then that became this thing, and I realized very quickly that I wanted to be the next Mr. Wizard. 
And if you guys remember Mr. Wizard, Don Herbert. Uh, and uh, I met Don Herbert at a science teacher convention. He was very gracious. It, it was really something. It was really something. Um, there you have a full-time job that's pretty risky to just stop and go do something completely different you mean october 3rd 19 <laughs> yeah. yeah. so uh, uh i quit my day job but i still worked as an engineer what was at that time this this still is called as a contractor engineer so if they had a specific tool something to assemble this precision gizmo i would make a drawing i you know design the parts to get these two things to fit and then uh, i made a a liquid intrusion resistant knob for airplane radios. That wasn't that hard a job, that's good. Uh, so, <laughs> there, you know, I don't know if you've been in an in a airliner cockpit, but there's all these buttons and knobs everywhere. The radios, by long tradition, are in the middle, in the console, it's called, and the volume knobs face straight up. And you may have been on an airplane. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry we're having difficulty with our communications equipment, because uh, the pilot dumped his coffee in the radio. <laughs> Oh, by the way, there are cup holders in the cockpits. <laughs> oh, yeah. Anyway, so it's a thing to keep liquids from flowing into the river. That was pretty good. But um, I was doing that while I was trying to write comedy. And it was really, as I look back, what was I thinking? So I had a saying I used to say all the time, if you're awake, you should be working. And I think I took it a little too seriously. But um, here we are. You know, I met a uh, motivation speaker back in the 80s named Mark Victor Hansen, who always used humor. So I asked him, do you have to be funny? And he said, only if you want to get paid. <laughs> so I wonder if there's something to, because all the magicians I know, they all use humor in their routines. Yeah, Michael, you should try it. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> no, not for me. <laughs> oh, man. We actually worked that out in the back uh, before. <laughs> Yeah, we had a whole sheet of ones we were trying, we crossed them out. That was the best one. Yeah, that was it. Sorry. The first time I was on Bill Maher's show, the old Politically Incorrect show, yeah. Kevin Nealon was the other, one of the other guests. And he was just coming up with these great bit lines. It's just so spontaneous. I thought, that's, you know, that's what it means to be funny, is to be spontaneous. Then on the first commercial break, he pulls out this little card, he ticks off the ones he used, <laughs> looks at the other ones, and puts it back on, and I went, ah. That's it. Well, it's a job. <laughs> it's a job. So, you know, when, when Jerry Seinfeld would come through Seattle on the comedy circuit before he was gigantically, enormously, enormously huge, he had, in, in the early days of it, he had a very small tape recorder. When the, you may remember the noun micro cassette was a brand. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it was a tape recorder, very small. And so he would sit at, br at brunch on Sunday and go through every joke, listen to it, and he had a list. And that's how you get to that level. It sounds like they're just screwing around, but uh, they, they work really hard at it. To, the guys who've made it work really hard at it. And that's what you did with the Science Guy show. You worked humor into it. Boy, the... I worked, well, maybe not humor. Yeah, I tried to have humor. Uh, <laughs> how long did it take to produce a single 30-minute show? Uh, so we would write, okay, wait, okay. That's a good question. So the big thing that the Science Guy show brings to the party uh, I got to tell you, first of all, speaking of Carl Sagan, I went to my 10th reunion and I managed to get a meeting with him. You know, he was on, he was a pretty big star by then, but I was an alumnus and blah, blah, blah. So I talked to the guy for less than five minutes and he said, I said, I got this idea for a show about science for kids. He says, focus on pure science. Kids resonate to pure science because it's really tempting and you will watch, uh, well, like, like Mythbusters. Those are shows about technology. I mean, in other words, technology is deeply involved, right? But Carl Sagan told me to my face, as we say in high school, <laughs> that uh, I should work on science, and he was, that was great advice. So we would take about a month and figure out what shows we were gonna do. And at PBS, you don't get, a, it's unconventional. You don't get 13 or 26, you get 20, 20 shows. You'd work out 20 shows, and what, it brings, what we bring to the party, I claim, is each show is figured out. It has learning objectives. And if there are any professional educators in here, a learning objective is a, uh, is a, a term that means something you can test. So at the end of the book chapter or the end of the radio show, the end of this fabulous event, uh, we can test you and you will spout humans and dinosaurs that not live at the same time or something. <laughs>
or uh, chemical reaction as a result of electrons changing or something, something specific. And uh, then, so that would do that for about a month. Then we would we bring in writers, mostly people who are funny, uh, people who could write funny things, that is, not just funny looking. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, they would write a show, then we'd shoot about nine days of shooting. Now, not for one show, but we generally do three shows at a time, all in nine days, this and that. Then there'd be a week of what's called on offline editing, and then a week of online, and then a week of sound effects. But all that's working um, in parallel, or so you have rather multiple in shows going yeah, on yeah. at one time. Yeah. And so I don't know if any of the people must hear must work in what in Los Angeles we call the industry. <laughs> and uh, you know that. But we did it in Seattle, and that was a mixed blessing. Uh, we did it in Seattle. What we always tell people is because that's where we lived. Wow, yeah. Uh, so I was on, um, on a Back to the Future cartoon show. And somebody, you may have seen it, it was on for a few seasons. So they would get in trouble, the cartoon characters from the movie, movies, Back to the Future. And then they would look something up in the video encyclopedia. And they brought in Christopher Lloyd, the actor, Doc Brown. Yeah, yes, we'll look it up in the video encyclopedia. And then it would go to me on camera. I had no lines. This is before the science guy was a big deal, or if it ever was, or a deal. And one of the time, OK, so we got the balloons. One's hanging on a string, the one you rub on your hair. And the idea is that they're going to attract, or sometimes repel. But you'd see it move around because it's hanging on a string. Well, it didn't move enough. You know, I'm doing this. And then, oh, let's fix the lighting. We're going to fix the lighting, tweak the lighting, tweak the lighting. Stand there for whatever it is, a minute. 45 seconds, and it's really lost the charge. So we do it, and nothing really happens. Bring in the glue, bring in the glue, bring in the glue. <laughs> 14 people show up. If anybody knows Spray Mount 77, it's like serious glue. So then the balloons go <laughs> I mean, it's, you can tell it's not, it's glue, all right? <laughs> but that's how you do it in Hollywood. And when we were in Seattle, there's nobody around to do that, to make those kind of directions. And I'm the head writer, and it's my freaking show. So we did a show on static electricity. And man, by the end of the day, I had received so many shocks <laughs> from a Van de Graaff generator. Do you know what I'm talking about? The aluminum, the rubber belt, just, just, just. 25,000 volts, 50,000 volts at very low current all day. Oh, God. And by the, but that makes, it gave the show a quality that that's, makes it stand the test of time. And you did a hundred of these? hundred shows, yes. hundred shows. And then, shows. And then uh, what, why not another 20 or what, did they just well, end the, it? By then, first of all, everybody had done a hundred show. A lot of, there wasn't a lot of steam left in the tank. Uh, <laughs> what is it? Fuel in the, steam in the boiler. <laughs> People were tired. And also, uh, uh, things changed at Disney. Michael Eisner left. Frank Wells got killed, and um, uh, it, it, just, it just didn't have the the, the uh, champion to keep it going. But so then, as you may know, I did several other shows: Conor Greatest Inventions, Conor Greatest Discoveries. Stuff happens. And Eyes of Nye. The Eyes of Nye. And so by the time we did The Eyes of Nye, thank you. The <laughs> Eyes of Nye, by the way, is where I got all the stuff about genetically modified food. But The Eyes of Nye was a show that was made for about a third of the budget of the Science Guy show. Because the PBS station in Seattle was not managed that well. The guy was forced to resign, and they lost a lot of money. And so it just it wasn't, the production values were very low. And uh, uh, we were always hoping to get the next you know, big thing. What is the next big thing? Well, the next big thing is the book after this one, which will be about climate change and energy. And what I want for the young people here, I want for all of us to be the next great generation. I am of an age where my parents were both in World War II. Oh, it, listen, if you get a chance <laughs> to be a prisoner of war for four years, <laughs> I would skip it. <laughs> I would not do that. So my dad was on Wake Island. I don't know if you've ever heard of this place. You, you go to Hawaii and then you go about that far again. 
and uh, it's the middle of Pacific Ocean nowhere, but it's tactically important. You can land planes there and stuff. So anyway, don't do that. And then, you know, everybody's all hot for uh, this very good looking young man, uh, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, <laughs> right? Uh, and the Enigma Code. So I, I've told this story a few times, but my mom was graduated from Goucher College in the spring of 1942. And the secretary, I mean rather, the dean of students at Goucher was, a, Goucher was a sister school to Johns Hopkins. The dean of students there was the first cousin of the secretary of war, Dorothy Stimson and Henry Stimson. Now, you guys, would it be different if we changed the name back to the Department of War? <laughs> you know, now it's the Department of Defense. It'd be a little more honest. Yes, we're defending our oil fields. <laughs> uh, <laughs> really? <laughs> would it be different? So anyway, he said to the Dean of Women, Dean of Students, can you get some girls, some women that can work on this thing? I can't tell you what it is. So although my mom was from the U.S. and lived in the U.S. through the whole thing, she worked on the Enigma code, my mother. The US, the US Navy had a big Enigma thing and they built some of those machines, or many of those machines, and mm -hmm. worked backwards. So uh, it was a heck of a thing, you know, that's an unbreakable, almost unbreakable code and they mm -hmm. just wailed on it until they figured it out. So wow. your parents were, had a scientific background. Yeah, right? but they were part of the greatest generation. That's what they call them, right? Well, you guys, with climate change, we're gonna need another great generation. We're gonna need people to pull together to make sacrifices, I suppose, to write songs about how we're all in this together. Like you listen to swing music, we're all in this together. This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna solve this problem. And so I wanna bring, get everybody excited about addressing climate change so that we can. How about, uh, since you're a science guy, science and technology solutions? Well, yeah, so I say you're gonna to have to have both. Electric cars. Electric cars are good. Uh, I, I love them. Does anybody not drive an electric car? <laughs> I feel bad for you. After you have an electric car, you'll never go back. It's just amazing. So um, uh, the trouble is, if we everybody had one all of a sudden, the grid can't handle it yet. And who makes the electricity? I know, yeah, right, we'll burn coal. Cool, no wait. Yeah, so uh, that's one thing. Uh, and we, the other thing, if you guys can find some way, you guys, young chemical engineers here, material science people, but you know, with your nanotubes, if you could find some way to desalinate seawater, it would be fantastic. It would just be fantastic. You know, that would really help people of the world. And uh, uh, then the other thing I really think, Michael, the longer we put it off, addressing climate change, the more drastic it's gonna be. Like, you don't like government interference now, you just wait, people. I mean, I just think back about, you know, there used to be rationing on rubber, rationing on food, victory gardens, all these things. That kind of stuff is gonna to have to come around again in a 21st century style. But the other thing, uh, there is a model for this, redistribution, uh, rather um, taking dividends from energy and redistributing it to people. And what we like to, in the, the, my community now, we call it uh, a uh, carbon fee. Mm -hmm. We don't want to call it a tax. You never call it a tax. <laughs> it's a carbon fee. No taxes. No, just, just, no, no, <laughs> evil, no. Well, why do you, what's the? Organized government, bad. <laughs> yeah. Traffic lights are bad. <laughs> so, everybody should have the right to be, okay. <laughs> so, uh, a fee and dividends, so you'd redistribute the fees for carbon. Whenever you make carbon, uh, carbon dioxide you drive and stuff, then you pay into this fund and then that fund is redistributed. It sounds crazy, but the model for this exists in that bastion of progressive blue state thought, Alaska. <laughs> And so you may not know, there's the, the Alaska um, fund, uh, 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 what's the middle word? Permanent. permanent fund, thank you. The Alaskan Permanent Fund, the APF. So you have to live there, but it doesn't matter how old you are. They redistribute the wealth. So they get, this year, the fund is worth about 42 million, and Alaskan residents will get $1,884. 
So if you're six years old, you're going to get $1,084. If to live there, though, you can't be registered to vote and living in, say, New York. Uh, and then you, and so, if it works, if it can work in Alaska, it seems like it could work. You know, it's like it's not the the science isn't that hard. People in Europe have no trouble getting it. The science? And, oh yeah, the science is and, we got and, that. And, yeah. and, and Europeans have no trouble with evolution. So what is it about Americans? You're the skeptic magazine editor. <laughs> <laughs> Man, yes, it but is. you're the guest today. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> you is, get to answer the question. What I always say, it's 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 just kind of an easy way out. You know, here's the thing that's so troubling, you guys, and I, I am just now, I am not 60, not yet, <laughs> but I, it was two years ago that I realized that I was going to die. <laughs> I thought, no, I thought that... April 3rd. <laughs> no, no, I thought that everybody else was getting older, but that I was fine. <laughs> I think that the whole yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm called, the same. It's called Everybody delusion. else is, they're suffering, but I'm good. <laughs> but then it became, it became clear, yeah. You mean denial's a wonderful thing. Is yeah, was, well, otherwise you couldn't <laughs> even press forward at all. So that fear of death, I think, drives people to extraordinary things. And um, it Don't you makes, think it's kind of political, though? I mean, the well, it's certainly become political. You know, climate change. It's like if you believe in that, you believe in communism, or well, yeah, you're, right. you're against well, the Constitution or capitalism yeah. or something. So, what the um, climate denier uh, organizers have been able to do is introduce the idea that uh, scientific uncertainty, plus or minus two or three percent, is the same as doubt about the whole thing. That scientific, plus or minus 2% is the same as plus or minus 100%. And they've been very successful. And I don't know how much you follow this, but they hired the very same guys, guys who now are in their 80s. They uh, work for tobacco. Yeah, yeah, who did, who did the jobs for the tobacco company, introducing the idea that a lot of people get lung cancer anyway. So this isn't really that much of a deal. And I smoke cigarettes and I'm fine. And this, 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 this. Another, my favorite one was uh, applesauce is toxic if you eat enough of it. Is it really? Yeah, somebody actually said, well, I don't know. You're I, the I haven't. <laughs> have you tested it? I've eaten a lot of applesauce, man. <laughs> and let me just say, I, I'm of a different generation. If peanut butter turns out to be bad, I'm You're doomed. doomed. Man. <laughs> I eat a lot, or popcorn. My goodness, I eat popcorn. So... <laughs> But, uh, but, but we don't have your climate book here yet. No. And your publicist would be... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't. So, uh, w why is it that Americans have so much trouble accepting evolution? So, is I think it's the fear of death. I you think do. it makes people a little nuts. You mean yeah. the, the need to believe in an afterlife and a materialistic mm -hmm. worldview that people think you have to have for evolution would deny that? Yeah, or there's trouble. It just seems... I mean, just think of all the stuff you know, all the images you can call up in your brain. All the algebra many of you can probably do, and word problems you can solve, and the reasoning and finding your way in a strange city or whatever it is, working, driving a car in traffic. You can do all that, and to think it all just goes away when you die. It sucks. I mean, it just sucks. <laughs> and so, Michael, this is in the book. I don't want to give, it's only a paragraph, but speaking of uh, Super Bowl, uh, where is that stadium this year? Arizona. Arizona. Is it hold It holds 80,000. Yeah. 80,000 people. So if you live to be 82 years old and seven weeks, and it depends on leap years whether it's seven weeks or seven and a half weeks, long, you get 30,000 days on Earth. Yeah. I, don't I wanna, know. Yeah. I want to know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so in this thought experiment, we are watching our life on the, football, on the football field in Phoenix, and every day you sit in a different seat <laughs> watching your life, okay? The 30,000, you don't get halfway around. It sucks. But that's not going to happen to us, right? No, no, no. We <laughs> ride bikes. We ride bikes. The yeah. singularity is coming in 2030, and if you can make it to there, you can make it forever. And so, you know, about the singularity, I talk. Are you skeptical? I touch on that too. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the singularity, but I do a lot of talks at colleges, universities, and people always ask me about the singularity. 
uh, always, quite often. And this is when someone builds a computer, or a group of people build a computer that's as sophisticated as the human brain. And then I always ask, what about my old boss? Oh, we've done that. You know, <laughs> you know. no, so oh, we, we thought about having an old boss joke in every chapter. <laughs> yeah. But got, that yeah. they got old? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, talk about my brain being this brain, this big, his brain, you know, like that. <laughs> but anyway, um, singularity. Singularity. Afterlife. Yeah, yeah. So the belief is that this is going to revolutionize the world completely. In, in 2030, when guys at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Caltech, make this machine that can not only win at Jeopardy, but you know, can drive a car as long as it's hooked up right, and as long as it's plugged in. I just, I just am always struck, there are 20%, a fifth of humankind has no electricity, lives without electricity. I mean, they're affected by electricity, they have all this stuff, all this cargo, as uh, Jared Diamond calls it. Uh, but they don't have electricity. It's not that they've never made a phone, a mobile phone call, cell phone call, they've never made a phone call. They don't have a phone. So when this computer takes over Cambridge, Massachusetts, are they even going to know it in Central Africa? Will it affect them at all? And somebody has to, uh, in many cases, literally shovel the coal. If you, the electri electrical grid goes out, we're dead. Artificial, smart official. But, but say in 500 years when we're off Well, oh, 500 coal, years, right. Yeah, 500 you know, years. So. <laughs> <laughs> when we're still When around. you and I are still <laughs> cycling on really nice bikes. <laughs> yeah. Mulholland Drive will be repaid. Carbon bikes. Where did yeah. they get that carbon? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. There's, there's no, a big shortage I mean, of it. Yeah. You're sort of invoking the precautionary principle. We've talked about nuclear uh, power before. You're a little concerned about that. What well, could because go wrong? nuclear power, I'm concerned about you guys, 433 commercial reactors, there's a lot of military reactors, 433 commercial reactors, three of them, Three Mile Island almost blew up, not quite, almost, Chernobyl blew up, Fukushima is not working very well, and I do a job for Toshiba every year, Toshiba, and um, everybody in that company knows somebody or knows somebody who knows somebody. Mm -hmm can't move back there for 300 years. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, would you get in a car that has catastrophic failure three out of 433 times? No. But what about all the people that die from uh, oh, okay. carbon and I got coal, you. coal I'm mines? And... I'm down. <laughs> That's not good either. <laughs> right. Yeah. So... Oh, but see, we kill people in other ways. <laughs> uh, great. <laughs> No, so, I mean, I'm a mechanical engineer. I, like so many of you, I you just can't wait for my mechanical engineer magazine every month. <laughs> and my colleagues just love nuclear power. I think it's the greatest thing. And I'm open-minded. You dig the stuff up, you fish in it, you put it back in the ground. It sounds like a great thing. But it's just too complicated for humans. It's Homer Simpson running the thing. That's what's wrong. <laughs> I mean, if it, if it, they just have something to prove to me, that's all. So, and this, and this gets to a couple of your chapters that you sort of, you sort of went out on the edge here on cloning you're skeptical of, GMOs well, cloning, you're skeptical of. I claim of. there's evolutionary reasons to avoid cloning, uh, especially my own boss. <laughs> but, but, and I start this like so many trains of thought with me, this starts with sex. <laughs> um, <laughs> that the best idea anybody has as to why anybody has sex, whether you're uh, a sea jelly, a dandelion, um, a jacaranda tree, the, the reason you have sex is to get a new combination of genes, a radically new combination of genes that the germ, your enemy is not lions and tigers and bears. They can be trouble, first to admit, <laughs> oh my. But your enemy is germs and parasites. That's what's going to get you. And Ebola would be a classic example. So by having a new combination of genes, living things apparently are able to stay just slightly ahead of the mutating germs and, germs and parasites. So if you clone yourself, you're going to not be doing the mix. You're going to be falling one behind. If you do that a few times, you're going to be falling behind her and behind her and behind her. And then you're going to show up at the emergency room, and the rest of us have to pay for your uh, rehydration and uh, resuscitation machine because you got some germs that the rest of us already dealt with. 
But do you, do you think people really want to clone themselves, or is it more just the technology can be used to produce organs in a peachy dress? Well, that's a whole nother. Yes. Ha, 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 Mr. Sherman. <laughs> Dr. Sherman. No, I'm a huge fan. The trouble is, historically and quite reasonably, they use the same word, cloning, for uh, 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 replacing stem cells in an, in an mm -hmm. egg. I mean, to me, what would be better, getting a titanium hip, like some people have, yeah. <laughs> oh, you, yeah. from a lot of bicycling, uh, or um, stem cells having your own joints, stem yeah. cells grow you a new hip. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thing is that they're done the same way. You, you, at least mechanically, you poke this crazy thin pipette into the ovum and the, that DNA out and uh, put the other <laughs> DNA in. And it's called fusion, fusing. And so, you, you know, there's a time when um, the uh, a fertilized egg is, is 160 stem cells or so before they've differentiated. And so if you could find a way to induce those to uh, make you a new hip, it would be just cool. Mm -hmm. And I went to Hans Kirstead's lab. This is a, the neuroscientist surfer. And uh, he breaks, it's, I mean, it's a little creepy, but it is the, what they do in medicine. He breaks the backs of the rats with this precision rat backbreaker gizmo. <laughs> Injects them with stem cells, gives them anti-don't-reject-my-cells drugs, conventional organ drugs. And in a few weeks, the rats are walking around. It's really amazing. Not to creep you out, they sacrifice the animals, and then take you know my, uh, micro uh, tissue very, slices. Tissue samples really thin, and you can see where the nerves have grown back together. Mm -hmm. So this is where science and um, ethics have to take uh -huh. a meeting. But why? But why say you're against cloning or whatever? Because very few people would really just clone themselves. Oh, no, themselves that's a charming that. thing. I just watched a commercial yesterday where she's got four copies of herself and they're all doing stuff at the same time. Yeah, yeah, but... It's really difficult. Yeah. And how many times have people said, Michael, you ought to clone yourself so we get this magazine out faster. <laughs> yeah, how many times have they said that to you? Uh, none. <laughs> they, say it, they say it to me. Not, well, not they don't say me to get your magazine out, but to get... But it's a little bit like the same thing about uh, G GMOs. Oh, GMOs. Uh, I have strong and correct opinions I know, about but, that. So I, I have to... Uh, correct you on your correct opinions here. So, uh, uh, you know, the European Union, which is not exactly uh, con considered, uh, you know, too cautious about these sorts of things, uh, just published a research study on a decade of EU-funded GMO research. The main conclusion to be drawn from the efforts of more than 130 research projects covering a period of more than 25 years of research and involving more than 500 independent research groups is that biotechnology, and in particular GMOs, are not per se more risky than, for example, conventional plant breeding technologies. I just published that in my latest column of Scientific American because I'm pro-GMOs. I mean... Well, uh, I'm kind of pro-GMOs. Kind of. Kind of. Well, here's my claim. Okay. And I, you can refute your brains out. Now, there were <laughs> two numbers in there. One was 10 years, one was 25 years. Yes. Okay. So, uh, first of all, when you modify a, an organism, and let's say it's corn, you know exactly what you're doing to the corn. I buy that. I am sure I have eaten, uh, compared to the rest of you, I've eaten a lot more popcorn, modified popcorn than any of you. I'll take you on. Because I have a popcorn problem. <laughs> With the peanut butter on it? or what? The, Yeah. <laughs> I'm right there. But my claim is that in 10 years, or in uh, the typical testing is three years, sometimes four years. The government review is typically three years or four years. In, those, in that short amount of time, less than a decade, you cannot be sure what you're going to do to the ecosystem. You don't know, you know exactly what you've done to the plant or the soybean, the corn, but you cannot be sure what you've done to the organisms that eat the organisms that eat the plants. But that's true of anything. I mean, we... Oh, yeah, yeah, but so you know, we would, here's the we've question. We've gone down that road 10,000 years okay, ago. But, so here's the question. Why is the... Uh, no, well, that's the second question. First question is... Uh, why do we need to do it? Do I need to fund it as a taxpayer? Totally get it, where Monsanto, for example, makes a better corn, 
that you can pour uh, a better or environmentally perhaps more benign insecticide on it and uh, mm -hmm. it'll grow fine. I mm -hmm. get you. But what about the two, so you guys, full disclosure, this is the only chapter in the book which I called What the GMF that <laughs> has genetically modified food that has drawn any criticism at all. I'm, uh, I'm going to go to St. Louis on something like the 10th, it's a Tuesday, I think, the 10th of February, and meet with um, Richard Fraley, who's the head of, he's the CTO, the Chief Technology Officer of Monsanto, and let him give me an earful about this. And if I'm wrong, I will say I'm wrong. But my claim is you can't know, <laughs> you, thank you, you can't know the ecosystem in 10 years. Well, you can't say you're wrong then because we wouldn't know for say 25 years or 50 yeah, So why not wait 25 years? What's well, the freaking Well, because hurry? there's people starving in Africa. Okay. Golden oh, rice. Golden rice now. Golden Michael, rice has saved you, millions. You, it has or it has the potential to? Potential. Yeah, well, okay. But, Oh, uh, well, 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 yeah, yeah. No, well, so the problem, <laughs> incidentally, this is the problem with the precautionary principle. You don't know. We we don't know how good, how much good it's going to do either. So, no, no technology would ever be developed if uh, we. This is. You know, it too I'd much. say it's it's easy to tell. Ten years is too short. That's my claim. I don't know. There's okay. people starving now. Uh, yes. Yeah, so now. our problem is not food production. I remind us: Are we addressing the problem that needs to be solved? Just in the United States alone, we waste a tremendous amount of food. Our problem is food distribution. Yes, that's true. Okay. There's a lot of political so corruption. So it doesn't mean that, that food distribution is the problem doesn't mean we shouldn't modify food. I'm right there with you, people. <laughs> the thing is just careful what you wish for. And the examples are classic. The papaya. Uh, you don't have to know anything about papaya. The one with the black spot virus looks like hell. The one without it looks great. And they modify, they, <laughs> people modified the genome so that with the virus, uh, a piece of the virus genome itself, so that the papaya is not susceptible. But probably for cautionary reasons, Japan doesn't allow importing of it. So this has affected the economics okay, mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. papaya production. All right, then the other one is the monarch butterflies. All right, now the monarch butterflies. They, like so many of us, love milkweed. <laughs> and by spring, the classic, uh, the classic stuff is um, Roundup, which has a name, Glycosol. Does anybody know the name? Help. Glyphosate. Glyphosate. That doesn't quite, I didn't say it right. It's a GLY word, and it's important. Glyphosate. Glyphosate. And it works great. <laughs> it, you can spray it on the field, kill a lot of the green plants, the corn will come anyway, but it also accidentally kills milkweed. So in certain areas, uh, the monarch butterfly population was decimated. And uh, I don't know if you've ever seen monarch butterflies. First of all, they're gorgeous. But the other thing about them, they're just it's crazy. They fly from almost Canada to Mexico. These are little, little butterflies. <laughs> and um, I am just fascinated with them. I'll tell you, I'm a mechanical engineer. I did a lot like so many people. I did so much fluid mechanics. I have watched butterflies swim, swim, fly upwind. It's cool. They exploit the boundary layer where the air is moving very slowly near the ground. That's just crazy. And then if you've ever been to a monarch butterfly landing zone, like Monterey Bay has a big park there, they're just... Just look around at the number of human heads in here. Imagine a million of those are butterflies. I mean, it's just crazy. So they're beautiful. And so to accidentally kill them was an oversight. How are we doing this? By putting Roundup on the milkweed. Oh, I oh, see. Yeah. Okay, all right. And, um, and so the reason you put Roundup on the milkweed is because you modified the corn to accept Roundup, to live through Roundup. Totally unintended consequence. But that's true for everything. Okay, so of yes. my claim so you is you got to pick and choose with that, that. That my claim is four years and four years is not enough. Yeah, okay. that's my claim. Well, and you'll right. find out when <laughs> the monoculture of Iowa is suddenly ravaged by a new uh, corn borer, European corn borer, which was an invasive species, which has now been controlled by modifying the corn so with the Bacillus thuringiensis bacterium, which makes the corn borer 
crystallize. He, his uh, or her digestive tract solidifies and they die. They starve to death. But they're corn bars screwing it. <laughs> so, and then what's happened, you get, and, then, and this is a separate issue. I'm the first to admit a separate issue. Get on a separate treadmill of a new type of, of insecticide, a new type of plant, a new type of insecticide. And what the, another unintended consequence is individual farmers have sold out and it's become this tendency to have monoculture. Mm -hmm. That is to say one type of plant over enormous areas. And that takes more energy to produce, more water and stuff. It's not, the ecosystem's not as robust. But you guys, I am open-minded, Michael. The guy agreed to have a meeting with me. He guy cool. can't wait. And if I'm wrong, I will... What Come they back here to Caltech. <laughs> you know, what they want you to do, if you've been down this road, you publish the book a second time with a never-before-seen footage or with <laughs> a new chapter. And if I'm wrong, I'm going to bring it on. But let me ask you this. Why are so many corporations opposed to putting GMO on the label? Well, because of the political hype over it. It's a, it's a well, sort why of a, not have their a own political not hype to make it natural. unhypeful? <laughs> I will leave it at this, that European countries who are so much more advanced than us on so many of these issues, who would agree with you on nuclear power, my adopted, well, not in France, my, though. my adopted country Germany, for example, mm -hmm. uh, is weaning itself off of uh, nuclear power. They're going total, you know, uh, I'm all for replenishing it, uh, They're energy. They're even the doing more solar than America, and they have mm -hmm. like one tenth the sunshine. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, but they are in favor of GMOs. They're not with you on the GMOs. So okay. just, just keep that and in I'm, mind. I'm that, ready. That, yeah. Yeah. So just because one person jumps off a bridge, <laughs> does that mean you have to jump off? <laughs> But these are your people, you see. Anyway. But I've spent, I spent a lot of time with it. Uh, I interviewed the Washington State wheat breeder, I, the gal at um, UC Davis who modifies the corn. And I'm right there, man. You can make better corn. God, the apples you get nowadays are so freaking good. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Uh, but my concern is we're going to have an accidental big mess by making these large monocultures because of... Uh, you modify things faster than the ecosystem can yeah, okay, fair enough. absorb it. So uh, before we uh, turn it over to the audience, and, and if you care to start lining up at the, the two microphones this here. This is really fun, Michael. Uh, I hope you guys, I, thank I just, you for sticking just around. just wanted to really uh, bring fun. it back to one last. We'll bring it back to where we began with Carl Sagan, and you, you end your book talking about uh, extraterrestrial intelligence and uh, are you optimistic for the future of human civilization and will we contact the aliens? So, uh, there's two questions. So, Car so, Carl Sagan started the Planetary Society in 1980. It's the world's largest non-governmental space interest organization, and by all accounts, we have a really cool logo. <laughs> so uh, we do, I like to say we do three things. We uh, educate, we have uh, uh, award-winning bloggers and journalists, Emily Lakdawalla, Matt Kaplan's here, Jason Davis. We have guys who really give the real information about what's going on in space exploration. Then we create. We have programs around the world where we're studying, we really are studying ways to deflect an asteroid. That's like a real problem. Uh, and maybe one of the reasons we've never heard from another civilization is you have to pass the asteroid test. <laughs> if you don't have a space program when you detect an asteroid, you go the way of the ancient dinosaurs. And then it's like, let's see, on a, on a PC, I think it's control alt delete, is that right? <laughs> on a Mac, it's wipe, it's a wipe command. Are you sure? Wipe. Uh, it would just take it all out. And then the third thing uh, we do is we advocate. So I go to Washington, D.C. from time to time. We have a guy, Casey Dreyer, who's our political analyst, and he's been eight times this year. And he schmoozes, he interacts with congressmen and women and uh, their staff, staffs, to encourage them to fund space exploration. And I'll just give you an example. Adam Schiff, who's a local guy, He's our uh, guy here. He's our guy, supports a mission to Europa. Europa is a moon of Jupiter that has twice as much seawater as the Earth. And then, um, uh, then John Culberson is from Texas, who as near as I can tell, is a devout Christian who believes that he is on Earth to find life on Europa. 
And he's a character. He's the coolest <laughs> guy. I, lo I just love him. Anyway, I love them both. But anyway, this is where it brings the blues and the reds uh -huh. together in a way like nothing else does. And what we want to do at the Planetary Society, and did I mention the big announcement tomorrow in the New York Times embargoed right now? What we want to do at the Planetary Society is, so, is answer these two questions. And if you meet people that say, I've never answered these questions, ask these questions, they're lying. Where did we come from? Where did we come from? How did we all get here? And that's what this book's about, is how did we all get here? And then the other thing is, are we alone in the universe? Are we alone? Now, the distances between stars are so fantastically huge. It's very unlikely that we'll fly to one. But we may very well hear a radio or light signal from them, detect them. And my friends, if we were to detect life on another world, it would change this one. No one would think about his or her place in space the same way. It would be like Copernicus or Galileo. It would change everything. And would not be an individual doing it. It would be a society who thought this was a worthy use of our intellect and treasure. A science-based society. A science thing. Yes. Would you say thing? Science? Science thing is a good. A science thing. <laughs> if we discovered fossil microbes on Mars, let alone something still alive on Mars, it would change the world. Does it have DNA? Does it turn out that Mars was where life started and it got hit with an impactor and ooh, ooh, and we're all descendants of Martians? Do, 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 do. <laughs> Are there, you know, when you go to Europa, they say you, uh, uh, it's four and a half billion years old with seawater. Are there Europeanians swimming around <laughs> down there talking about, you know, algebra? Like, who knows? You know, Sagan used to make this point that Th those big questions, any time before us, before our generation, they didn't have the technology to answer the question. And any, anybody in the future, 100 years from now, they'll have the answers to those questions. We're the ones that get to try We're living to right there. Right there. So the 2020 rover will land on Mars in um, <laughs> 2021. It'll leave it. it might be 2022, depends what time of year it wants. You can only go every 26 months to Mars, Earth, Mars thing. And then who knows what it'll discover, it'll be the caching rover. So what we at the planetary side, then I'll wrap it up. We advocate for one and a half billion dollars for planetary science. So if you ask people what they think the budget for NASA is, and I mentioned NASA because it's still the world's largest space agency, by a factor of about three. Uh, NASA budget, many people will say, is 10% of the U.S., but no, it's 0.4%. And planetary science at one and a half billion, if we could get it up to one and a half billion, would be uh, 9%. So it'd be 9% of 0.4%. Anyone? Uh, 036, I think, 36%. <laughs> I mean, 0.036. And so it is interesting to note, is anybody from Canada here? <laughs> I carry all the time the Canadian $5 bill, which has celebrates uh, their space program, the space station, and uh, an astronaut in a suit, whom we presume is Chris Hatfield, walking around there. Uh, and it's just an interesting thing that we take it for granted here in the U.S. that things are going to get done in space. We all have our global positioning system. We complain when the weather reports off 18 minutes. And all that comes from space. <laughs> and so what we want to do is advocate for space exploration so that we can, dare I say it, change the world. <laughs> Let's Thank hear you. it for Bill Nye. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Michael, lead All right, on. we'll take a few uh, minutes I'll try to tighten Let's, it up. I'll uh, try to tighten it up here. No speeches, quick question, and let him rifle through answers. Go ahead, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Bill Nye, I want to ask you a question regarding GMOs. But first of all, I want to tell you that I got... Can you tip the microphone yeah. down towards your head? There you I go. got Thank stuck you. You go. living in a small town in Missouri in the Bible Belt. And you were the oasis for my little I love boys. You, man. <laughs> and one of them is here, but you taught them science and and to have critical thinking and so being here is such an honor to see you after all those years. I love you. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> and that's a human thing, not connected to religion as such. 
Also, your Ken Ham debate was exceptional. I've seen many of them, Bring but you really, really <laughs> did a Hire great this job. Hire woman. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my question on GMOs is this. I used to work as quality assurance for Monsanto. And I did the molecular uh, studies for plants, GMOs. I ended up resigning from that position. I'm not going to tell you why. You'd but, have to kill us. Uh, no, no, I will get killed. <laughs> uh, but, I, but you made a statement regarding that we know what happens when genes are inserted into the plants. Well, you, you can know the gene sequence, right? Well, when I was doing it, or studying, or examining those studies, because they had to go through quality assurance to be approved, uh, they didn't. It was a process where a gun with gold dust was used to inject these genes wildly into the plant. And because genes are interactive, they have communities and, you know, some suppress, and now we know with epigenetics there are operator genes and all kinds of stuff that is working on a different level. They really didn't know what was landing where. It was just the outcome. So is there a question? The question is, when you made the statement that we know what is going on, oh, I see. Oh, has I, that a, changed through 2003? Do you know oh, yeah, specifically? Yeah, the gene sequencing machines over the last 10, 12 years, oh, they've come a long way. Yeah. So Monsanto is using that, you think? Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. They got gene sequencing out the yin-yang, <laughs> yin-yang of yin. Okay. But, and, you, and as I say, when I say know the organism, I mean to a you know, few orders of magnitude, accuracy, you know what you got. Okay. Uh, I agree with you, but you don't really know everything. At that and, time, and they didn't, so that's what I just, wanted. Yeah, pointing it out, yeah. Uh, when you meet with the CEO yeah, in Chesterfield. Mr. Dr. Fraley, don't yeah, who's tell won him. a bunch of awards, big deal guy. Don't tell him about me, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, just boy. let me be specific, when you talk about genetically modified organisms, generally you mean taking a gene from one species, separated over geologic timescales and putting it in this species, th that species into this species. George Washington and those guys were taking pollen from one plant and shaking it onto the eggs of another. I mean, I get it. That's sort of uh, intra-species modification. We're mm -hmm. talking about species separated over enormous time scales. And I'm not saying it's inherently a bad idea. I'm saying let's be careful. Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you for being here. Very quick question on the GMO. Uh, I want to take you back to when you said that why don't corporations respond uh, uh, and, and put out information? And they do. In response. I mean, yeah. They do indeed. Um, my, but they suppress putting GMOs on labels for food right. and store shelves. Right. That's for and, sure. And my question to you would be, and my question to you is very simple. Would you be uh, uh, opposed to putting labels on vaccines that say may cause autism? Oh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. They're the same thing, aren't they? No, not to us on this side of it. Sorry. Yeah. Not to, uh, in the skeptical community. No, right. sorry. It the seems scientific to me... evidence against that is overwhelming. Sorry, man. But, but the, the perspective of the American people um, about what GMO means is badly confused scientifically, so putting the label on, wouldn't that be miscommunicating an idea really badly? No, no. No, the difference is... It doesn't say may contain GMOs. It says contains GMOs. But when you, it, it, that communicates any. something more than that, okay. and when you know that, that's the problem. That's okay. my point. That's okay. all. Okay. Okay. I can't. Yeah. You may See be what right. happens when you okay. write something controversial. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah it's cool. I think it's good. <laughs> okay. And as I say, I may be wrong. Well, oh, tip it back up. Party on, man. Take control. <laughs> <laughs> So you grab it and tip it back towards you. It's, it's friction. Like it's manageable. Okay. Go for it. Go ahead. No, it's all right. Go ahead. All, this is, the bones <laughs> light up. Yeah. As a kid, I used to do that a lot. It was a fun show. Anyway, um, you mentioned that having a pretty accent can help you influence people. Well, um, it, well it, uh, my claim is I'm not sure people in Kentucky would have embraced Ken Ham in the same way if he didn't have an Australian accent. Okay. He made reference to it in the first paragraph of his thing there. Go ahead. Well, that, I think, yeah, it sounds, sounds true. Um, but I'm saying that uh, progressives can't really recruit James Bond-looking sounding people to run for office in the states. So you want me to run for office? No. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. 
true. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> My question is, um, it seems like conservatives really get their feet wet in nourishing the next generation of political leaders. Do you think that secular people do the same thing, or, or at least the secular elite do the same thing, or should they do the same thing? Um, I mean, should secular people run for office? No, should uh, powerful people who are secular help nourish the next generation of secular leaders? Well, are I mean, they doing that? Everybody's got to do what he or she is comfortable with, right? Michael, have you right. well, promoting not, Well, I'm sorry. Not, I'm uh, sorry to interrupt, but I mean, that's what religious people say often. You know, I'm not comfortable teaching creationism to... So well, what are you saying? I'm saying... Um, that everybody in here has an obligation to go out and... No. Is there an institutional deficit of powerful secular people helping to nurture the yeah, I, I see where he's going with it. Okay, first of all, you know, having a secular government simply means you, religion has nothing to do with the government. You could be personally religious as much as you want, as long as that not, has nothing to do with your, how you vote. That's all it means to be a secular government. So I, I think what he's really asking is more out and out atheists, agnostics, whatever, running for office, because in fact, people's religious beliefs do influence how they vote. So that, that's really what he's getting at. But let's keep it, let's keep it rolling there. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Appreciate it. Uh, this might just be a clarification on the previous question about GMO labeling. Mm -hmm. And that would be, uh, do, would you not agree that the moment that GMO labeling is uh, mandatory and forced, that the argument would go from, well, why don't they want GMO labeling? You gotta think about it, to, oh my gosh, they're labeled for a reason. There's something bad with them. I think that was more of a clarification on, the, on, on that question. Yeah, I totally follow I, I, you guys. I, 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 do, I would agree that the, the general public is going to look at that and they're going to think, well, there's something wrong with those, they're, those are bad, and it's kind of needless. Or what will five years go by and everybody buys, it might say, interspecies GMO. Five years go by, everybody buys it and everybody's fine, and then the controversy goes away. Could go the other way, right? <laughs> That's right. Right? Okay. Uh, as I say, I eat all the freaking popcorn. <laughs> yeah. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, I grew up watching your show, and I just, <laughs> I just recently watched the episode um, on evolution, and it made me really upset to realize that an episode like that would kind of be a touchy subject now for some parents. Oh, you guys, in 1994, <laughs> Got a call from PBS. This is really a real true fact, not a false fact. <laughs> <laughs> Which at that time was, uh, I guess still was in Northern Virginia, in Fairfax, whatever. Be sure to say that evolution is only a theory. And I just slam. No, sorry, lady. No, no. Sorry, go ahead, please. Well, that answers my question. I was, <laughs> I was wondering if there was any worry about that on the show. Well, we, um, we, this is another advantage of being in Seattle. Just, <laughs> seriously, just being a little off the beaten path, we just did it. And okay. if I had it to do again, I, you know, I would do it a lot better. We have limited resources back then. So was there any turning point um, between then and now that made it such a touchy subject? Or have you just seen the same? I don't know, Michael. You? So it's, <laughs> uh, seriously. Yeah, was was it, has there been like a turning point? Or There's been was? this anti-science conservatism that has taken place over the last 20 years. I think that's why maybe most of you are here. Uh, and where it comes from is not clear because, what, well, you can say politics, but that's a big thing. Over the well, earth. That's European why. countries yeah. are super political. It's it's the religious influence. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's that that's causing the problem. The the the, the percentages that that forty percent of Americans who don't accept evolution has been pretty stable. Still, not, right, Don? Uh, you know, about forty, forty four percent. Oh, I want to thank Don Prothero, who really helped me with the book. Yeah, Don. Where is he? I'm fine. Yes, thank you. So vigilant we must be. Go ahead. Thank you. My concern is about books like yours being written for a particular audience of people who are already receptive to these ideas. And I'm an educator myself, and so the concern that I have is when people are presented with facts that go against their very deeply held beliefs, they become intractable and they dig in their heels. So how do we communicate these ideas to people who are just rejecting them out of hand? All right, that's a fantastic question. Let us run the following little test. Stand by. How many people are, what can we say, let's say atheists or agnostic here? 
How many of you were oh, brought boy. up? How many of you were brought up in a religion? Wow. And so it's about the same number, right? It's pretty Visually, close. Yeah. 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 So my claim, my belief is, wait a minute. <laughs> what I think is, <laughs> you don't change like that. It, you you got to be exposed to secular ideas, to agnostic, atheistic ideas for a long time, for years. And it's got to steep. It's just like um, skepticism with regard to ghosts and angels and um, the connection between autism and uh, vaccines. It just it's got to steep. You got to think it over. And so along that line, in my book, and by the way, there's 20 books in a carton. If you have friends. <laughs> Uh, I did it. People, you, people describe it like you used to say breezy style. <laughs> I didn't say that one, yeah, but, yeah, but okay. that would be one of them. Yeah, is I re I talk in many many passages in the book are based on my own experience. I remember the time I met Ivan the gorilla. No, you don't. Yeah, yes, I do. Actually, yes, I do. <laughs> and so uh, I wrote it. I wrote it in that way to engage people. So, but I will say again, the longest journey starts with a single step. So well, I wrote really, the book. That's good. That's really good. <laughs> <laughs> Chevy, I, I mean, attribution, Chevy Chase. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It's Kevin Nealon. I meant Kevin Nealon. Kevin Nealon. <laughs> um, so uh, I wrote this book trying to engage people, and it was number one on Amazon.com's creationist bestseller list. <laughs> and I mention it because creationists are interested in it. They're reading it, and I think the opportunity is with young people, the future. You know, once somebody's entrenched in his or her idea mm -hmm. about the origin of the world and the uh, creation myths or uh, um, where we all came from myths, right, and we, we have one, you know, I mean, ours is a little more reasonable to me. Uh, the, the, it sits with you, it takes a long time. So I, you can want to blow your brains out or you can chip away at the problem. And so I'm, mm -hmm. I believe I'm chipping away. That's a great question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, you were able to reach so many people with your show. I love and, you, man. Uh, <laughs> and part of what made Cob Cosmos, the reboot, such a big thing was it was the first time in a long time that there was a science-based show on prime time. And so my question is... By the way, is, the producer's here. Brandon Braga, are you here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, he, anyway. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but with television driven by ad sales and uh, shows needing to have good ratings in order to uh, get those ad sales up, how do you go about financing and funding a, a science-based show in today's television climate? Well, note well, the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> It's not really a science-based show, but that is, most weeks is the most popular show on television. Not the most, not the most popular sitcom, most popular show. So people watch it who have a acceptance of science, right? Then uh, the Discovery Channel is an enormous $4 billion business. I'm not saying it's all good, but there's a market for it. No, I mean, really, there's some shows, I mean, NASA's Unsolved Mysteries, whatever, that's a History Channel thing. That maybe is not the greatest thing. Uh, but, you know, I don't know how much you know about it, but you can turn it off. You know, when people complain <laughs> about television, it's not the problem. It's just one more opportunity. As far as getting the Science Guy show funded, it was at a different time with different leadership. I don't know if you remember Tipper Gore. You can have different feelings about her, but she really spearheaded this idea that uh, television stations or station groups had to have three hours of educational programming a week. And man, these station managers are just running in circles screaming. It's like, oh my God, we're all going to die. My license to print money is going to be turned off for three hours a week. <laughs> and so, uh, so, you know, IFLS, do you know IFLS? I fucking love science. Sorry. My, my word, I love science. <laughs> IFLS is, has over 4 million followers. Maybe it's 7 million followers. So the, I think we're at a tipping point. Mm -hmm. The tipping point, perhaps, that you alluded to by Carl Sagan, we're living at this extraordinary time. Mm -hmm. 
So what we do is try to make it, everybody, when you go to make a television show, it has to be entertaining first. Yep. Sorry, it cannot be, you know, fact first. And so that's what we did on the Science Guy show. So we, all I'm going to tell you is we're trying to do it, man. We're chipping away at the problem. That's, that's a good question. Yeah. Well, first, thank you for all you do. Both I love you, man. <laughs> Both you. We love you, man. Um, when, when, when you use the word evolution, some people think of monkeys turning into men. But most people still think of wet biological processes. Really? And, and my, my take on that is that um, evolution is really a much more general concept that whatever can exist in an environment can exist. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so sir, if, if this were a game show, could you express that in the form of a question? Yeah. So, okay. Okay. So. Okay. So. Um, I, I, so the development of artificial intelligence and the singularity is part of our natural evolution. But I, well, I, I don't hang around with people like Ken Ham. But is there? Do you think that an expansion of the term evolution to mean anything that can exist and survive, no matter how it gets created? Um, is part, what, of, yeah, part sure. of evolution. Yeah. Well, because I think like people like Ken Ham think that it stops at man because we're the last. Oh, he definitely thinks that. I mean, along with his other extraordinary things. Oh, yeah. He thinks we're it. We're done. You can't do any better than this. Yeah. So what about expanding that? Because I don't think the, the lay person, that's my point. I don't think a lay person, you say evolution, they think of biolog biology. So you think you're saying that the advanced computer is a natural result of biology. Yeah, okay. just like our intelligence and our You should brains. write a book, because uh, <laughs> I follow you, but I, like for example, if we go to another planet with other wet living things, I'm not, I'm not clear that they would come up with transistors and stuff, they might. Well, eventually, given in four billion years, it might. I mean, they might, but I I'm mean, not, certainly, all, you're saying the artifact, the things, the tools we make, mm -hmm are a result of evolution. Yeah, well, yeah. one of my big ideas is that humans are part of the ecosystem. Uh, <laughs> no, yeah. but seriously, for that's, a guy like good. Ken Ham, for a guy, the creationist, I think they strongly feel that they're separate, that they're special, that they are, that the deity mm -hmm. made them a big deal. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you ever met my old boss, you know that's obviously <laughs> not true. <laughs> so, I'll give you that computers are a result of evolution. I don't see myself uh, pounding the table about making the point, that but point. The, other the, the, that's, the, that's, the SETI program is kind of premised on the idea that they will have radio I got no problem with that. Yeah. Well, and well, I was going to say, so the one way to make sure we don't hear from another civilization by radio or light is not to listen. That will guarantee it. Yep. So at the planetary side, we support search for extraterrestrial. Okay, life. we got to go on to the next okay. one. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Thank you. And thank you for wearing my favorite colored tie. Uh, purple? <laughs> Me? Or, oh, oh. oh. <laughs> Mr. Nye. Um, uh, that's good, Michael. The whole monotone thing. Yeah. That's good. It's a skeptic uniform. Go ahead. Skeptic uniform. I'm glad, glad I missed it by that much. Yeah, you inadvertently <laughs> asked part of my question with the last question about the singularity because I tend to think that technology is a necessary part of evolution. Well, it's certainly for humans. Humans would not be the global right. empanage kickers that we are without so, our technology. Right. So I won't go there, but uh, you know, how far do we have to go with Moore's law? Go ahead and answer that one. Because how far do we have to go with Moore's law? Mm -hmm. Well, as a guy who decided to go mechanical instead of electrical, <laughs> I got no idea. I mean, but it sure seems like it's a long. We have, you know, when I was doing it, we would do lithography. We would do. Uh, chips at 50 molecules, getting down in 30 molecules. Then, in other words, the silicon's 30 molecules thick. You're getting to half of that, they, we, it. We haven't so I don't know, man. It's still yet. a ways off. The other thing that's happening now, how many people here, for some reason, do not know how to write computer code? <laughs> oh, there's a few. <laughs> no, there's so many engineers coming out of school now in computer science who can write code that all these shortcuts are being developed to, even though it's an existing computer, an existing machine with existing transistor, transistor logic, all the signal compression and so on and checking for errors, 
So there's a lot of stuff going on in exchange or parallel with Moore's law to make computers even faster and faster. <laughs> so I think we got to, you can count on a lot more developments over the next 20 years. But we got to get to work on climate change, and we got to find ways to produce electricity and store it more economically. <laughs> cool question. So you can plug in your electric car more. So places. I can plug in my electric car. You guys, you'll never go back. This is the coolest. <laughs> All right, let's go. Yeah. Um, do you have any comments on the role of capitalism in climate change? Yes. That is now there. That is, is a great question. This is in the next. This is the next book. Yeah. So. So people have argued reasonably that capitalism is inherently bad, and people have argued quite reasonably that capitalism is inherently good. But I think it's, capitalism is uh, what humans do, but to make sure that everybody gets a fair shake, it has to be regulated. And this is not extraordinary. I mean, you guys, I just remember, uh, this won't take too long, it is to be hoped. When I was a kid growing up back east, you'd go to the beach in Delaware. I still do go to the beach in Delaware. And when I was a kid, there was tar on the beach all the time. You come, there was so much tar, how much tar was there? You come home, people would have, and I say home, rented a uh, house for the week. People would have a, a tin of gasoline on the porch and a rag to take the tar off your feet didn't want the kids traipsing the tar through the house. And if somebody saw a dolphin, this would be an Atlantic bottlenose dolphin, people would like, totally freak. And they'd go running down to the beach, it's a dolphin, oh my God, it's a dolphin, it's fantastic. Well now, those bleeding heart liberals, <laughs> with their goddamn Clean Water Act, <laughs> now there's no tar on the beach, and there's dolphins, 50 dolphins, 100 dolphins, every day swimming this way, they come back this way. And it's because tanker companies are no longer allowed to flush their tanks just into the ocean. So, but that's capitalism, and people drive more than they ever did. And so, it's regulated. So we need to regulate carbon put into the air. The answer is both. It's good and bad. Um, I just wanted to know how you feel about the fact that you've sort of inspired and shaped the minds of so many people, including myself, and if you ever expected that to happen when you started the show. I love you, man. <laughs> Whoa, man. <laughs> and two things. First of all, the objective of the Science Guy show, and I put this online, it's on my website, and it was 1992-93 was to change the world. <laughs> that was the objective. It's in print. I have it, the, the very first document framed in it's my on house. on your wall. <laughs> yeah, he's seen it. But it did? <laughs> like, you're joking me. <laughs> so I say this all the time, I don't get it. I mean, you, I, mean I love, it's cool. I, intellectually, I hear your words, and it's thrilling. <laughs> but I still kind of don't believe it. I mean, I love you, man. So, uh, thank you. And what I want, uh, I don't need to know, but you're in your 20s? No, I'm 15. You're 15? Yeah. Wow. Um, wow. No, then you watched it in a second wave. Do you see what I mean? The show was made 20, you watched it in school. Yeah. I thought I loved bef you before, now I really love you. <laughs> All right, so what I want to do is I, if you guys become the next great generation, then we will have gotten somewhere. If you <laughs> change the world. So thank you. Gosh, thank you. Cool. I have to tell you a little story. My uh, wife Jennifer and sister Tina, who are here, uh, spent a Halloween evening with Bill at his house over in Studio City, and he had a guy with a clipboard counting 1,700. Steve, my old buddy Steve. Yeah, he's buddy Steve. 1,700 kids in three hours, and he's on his knees handing candy out with his little Bill Nye and the goggles and the, and the lab coat. And of course, they knew he lived there. You know, they're lined up down the sidewalk. Yes, it's. Uh, but you guys, so one year I wasn't the scientist guy for Halloween. Halloween is a holiday that makes no sense based on tradition. Uh, but I was a, a rocker. I had the same wig from the Static Electricity show and I had a, a black, you know, kiss style face paint. 
And kids recognize me anyway. <laughs> Why don't you, I thought we were the science guy. What are you doing? <laughs> so I just don't fight it. I just don't fight it anymore. Just bring it on. It's cool. And, it, and it's his cool. buddy Steve was dressed up as him so he could take bathroom breaks once in a while. That's right, yeah. Steve. <laughs> so uh, Steve uh, worked on the, con he put my microphone on me when he was a floor director at the NBC affiliate in Seattle, K King TV. Seattle's in King County. And uh, he's been a friend of mine, you know, 30 years. Okay, uh, go great. Ahead. Uh, Bill and I, I'm a huge fan of yours, and I love you to death. Unfortunately, I'm from, Louisville. I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. And I think you've done the people of Kentucky a huge disservice by not defending Kentuckians when you put up a picture of a map about Kentucky. In the only sense, I'm not, you know, the yeah. only sense is that uh, very few people support the art getting built. Very oh, I few. know. So this is an exciting yes. time. Yeah, exactly. So I just, yeah. I just, so that's just no. my first statement. My bigger, my question to you, you can come back to this, uh, <laughs> come back to this later. My question to you, and I fully support your stance on GMO, and I appreciate you saying that. I may be wrong. The, you may be wrong, but the people need to appreciate that as well. And the only thing to note is when are you and Neil deGrasse going to have a debate on GMOs. Oh, so a couple things. Uh, let's keep in mind that Neil is a dear friend of mine. I was at Thanksgiving at his house, at his apartment, and uh, he's, uh, he's into it, but he's not that into it. And he, I did go to the IQ Square debate in New York, where Rob Fraley was, and two people from the Union of Concerned Scientists were there, and they got their butts kicked. The corporate people just wailed on uh, my people. Uh, so Neil would probably not get involved in that. And just one other thing I want you guys to understand. I am not fluent in French. I'm not a Francophone. Uh, my ancestors were French, but you know you have a Corvette. T okay, it has an E on the end. And French people, just like their furniture, just keep adding letters, just add stuff. <laughs> so if it's got an E on the end, then you don't hear the E. If it ha doesn't have an E on the end, like a Chevrolet, then you don't hear the T. So it's de Grasse, de Grasse, Neil de Grasse Tyson. Just something that kind of drives me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm not, I don't speak French, but I just hear it. So, uh, no, we, he and I would probably not de debate GMO. But stay tuned, you guys. I may go to St. Louis and get my ass kicked. <laughs> this guy may just show me that I'm totally wrong about everything. And I will say, as a scientist, I bring it on, right? Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank, you. Thank you. All right, we're going to take uh... a week. Let's just cut the lines off right here and just get it done. <laughs> now, if you finish all these questions, we'll just get it done. No more questions in the line. We'll just get all these done. Go, Michael. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm here not to make a question, but to ask you a favor. <coughs> when you have the meeting with the guy from Monsanto, can you please ask them to develop a cubic banana? Just to shut up, okay. Ray Comfort was and for all. <laughs> okay. Oh, because the evolution, it's the perfect thing? Yeah, the, yeah. Cubic banana. Exactly. The banana is perfect. <laughs> And keep in mind, bananas are radioactive. <laughs> like calcium, man. Let's do two more on each side and then kind well, of... Well, then but there's only three on that okay. side. Come well, on. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Seattle Hello, Mariners, Mr. right on. <laughs> Either, I'm a huge fan of both of you. Um, I'm going to read off my phone. But um, you brought up the intelligence squared. Uh, my question is kind of uh, based on, some, on a uh, debate that you were in, Michael, um, regarding uh, if... Um, Science refutes God, and uh, your partner was Lawrence Krauss. And the opponent to this, one of the opponents, Dinesh D'Souza, said that um, God must exist because since she is so prevalent in our society, that that's actually proof of her existence. So, you guys countered by saying that um, it would be crazy to suggest that humans don't have a tendency to be religious, and that would violate evidence of reality. Um, so it's not proof of God's existence, but rather just proof that humans have a tendency. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
Knowing what, question, uh, dude, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, knowing about what you guys said about the natural tendency to be religious, do you think we will ever get to a point in society where religion will be 100% abolished? Uh, well, it's not impossible. Uh, European countries have plummeted their rates of religiosity from something like what we have here, like 90 to 95% in pre-World War II, to in some northern European countries like Scandinavia, Denmark, and so forth. The rates are less than half. 20%, 30%. Full disclosure, read Michael's new book, The Moral Arc. Not full disclosure, pro, shameless plug. The full, <laughs> uh, <laughs> read Michael's new book where he talks about the arc of uh, religion so going away and being replaced by... Well, I don't know like if it'll be 100%. humanism will kind of replace it? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it ever could be 100%. But it, uh, on the one level, we don't care if it doesn't influence anything. If well, it doesn't influence Yeah, this is what I say in my book, uh, Changing it. Back Would that to, be? Is this the, the, yeah, the one? Yeah, changing back to yeah. me. 20, 20, 20 hard covers in a carton. Uh, I have no. In general, I have no problem with anybody's religion. You know, people get tremendous community out of it. They share tables. They eat together. They get a lot of uh, uh, reinfor. Uh, they feel good being part of the religion. It's just. The Earth's not six thousand years old. It's just the, I'm sorry, man. No the reason what. I ask is okay, because we, out of we got to keep going. Okay. Okay. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Um, I was just going to ask, um, what's some advice you can give uh, younger people that uh, grow up in religious environments? Um, something that can help them motivate them to critically think and whatnot. So, are you were you brought up in a religious environment? Oh, yeah. To answer a question with a question. Yeah, I read my book. Buy a carton. I did. I read the whole book. <laughs> I love you, man. Give it to all I, your I, family I, members. <laughs> I, I read. I, I read your book. I brought it, you know, for you to sign and everything. Um, but I, I grew up in Baptist, a Baptist and Catholic school, so um, that was a hostile environment, you know, to be asked questions and. You know, so are you okay or not? No, yeah, I'm fine. I was asking for like advice you can give to other people who may so be watching this. What I say is, just remember when it. you talk to somebody about <laughs> your beliefs and his or her beliefs that might be religious, right. don't expect to change their minds like that. Doesn't I guess that's that the way. first thing. Yep, okay. it that takes, you got to be exposed to that, just like ghosts and haunted houses and, and um, um, horoscopes. You got to be exposed to the... Uh, skeptical point of view many times before you get it. There's my advice. Yeah, thank you. You. Chip away. So what about Are we claim? adding people to this line? No, we got to cut it up. So we just have these two and those two and then that's it. Okay, all right. Because people want to get their books on. I know, I know. Yeah. I just, I thought we 20, were There was 20 in a card and it's going to take a while. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, quick, quick. What about the claim that on game day, the outside temperature would have <laughs> dropped, the, dropped the pressure in that ball by a pound and a half? <laughs> uh, I'm going to do that test uh, diligently, but just looking at PV equals NRT, it didn't look like it could go down nearly that fast. Fifteen <laughs> percent. Um, no, the other claim was that you warm it up when you exercise it, when you squeeze it. You do warm it, but it's still a closed system, so once it gets back to the same tip. No, I mean, they were cheating, okay? <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Hello. Uh, so it's it's clear that in a lot of fields of science there are an unequal number of men and women and I'm just wondering if you think that there is some discouragement for young women and oh, young yeah. girls. Yeah. But the longest journey starts with but a single step. <laughs> and the key to our future, half the humans are girls and women, so half the scientists should be women. Alright, because <laughs> science is the best thing you've ever had. Now, I remember I remember my mom could not get an American Express card because she was Mrs. Nye instead of her own self. She was somebody's wife. Uh, my dad's, that's right. My dad's. Uh, and so she had a master's degree at that point. She went on to get a doctorate, my mom. And this is about 1973. She could not get an uh, American Express card. And she was furious. And she marched in the Equal Rights Amendment parade, and she told us she threw her bra in the fire. I don't know if she really did. But there's a fire in front of the U.S. Capitol. Uh, anyway, it wasn't that long ago, and a lot of progress has been made. But we also have a long way to go. And let me just also say, because I think about this nowadays, my mom, along with that, would tell you whether or not uh, whether women could wear cocktail dresses at black tie events, yes. But at white tie events, women must wear gowns that reach the floor. 
and this was important to her. At the same time, she wanted an American Express card. So we don't want to change everything. Uh, but that's something we're going to chip away at. And by the way, education, raising the standard of, women, of women and girls through education is, in my view, the best way to reduce the world's population yep. so that we have wanted children at a higher standard of living. And then, while this is obvious, you know, bleh, right on, Bill, getting it done is complicated. <laughs> so fight the good fight, my friend. Go get them. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> penultimate, penultimate. Thank Second you. Second to last. Yeah, um, I was recently criticized by a very good friend of mine for posting and liking things online about pro-science and skepticism. Uh, she's very devout Roman Catholic. Uh, Roman Catholic, what, they, they are all about evolution. The Pope I'm, I'm came out and what, said, evolve people. What advice would you give for promoting science and skepticism in a way that is not offensive or at least not so offensive that it will shut down communication? I got a feeling you're doing, it's the way you're going about it. Because the Roman Catholic Church, is, they got an they got a astronomer at the Vatican and the Pope just came out uh, saying evolution's a real deal. So uh, in that one example, I'm not sure. You stump me. Well, well, one way you do it is you do it with good cheer and humor and respect, and, but you stick with the facts and you don't back down from reality. That's how you do it. Okay. There. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> don't back down from reality. Yes, sir. Bill, you're the man. <laughs> I love I'll, you, man. <laughs> I'd love to hear your thoughts on space tourism, and if we colonize Mars, would you go? Okay. Space tourism is going to be fun. We just had a huge setback. Uh, you know, Virgin Galactic had a crash, apparently avoidable, but it's always avoidable. It's always something. So, uh, I mean, if there's a market for it, you know, bring it on. I just want it to be environmentally responsible. Don't want to be burning old tires just for the sake of it. But I think it will give everybody, literally, a world view that will change them. According to all astronauts, once you see the Earth from space, man, it changes you. And uh, uh, so I'm very supportive of that. And I mentioned uh, a member of the planetary said, so check out ISS above, where you can see cameras that are orbiting the Earth and keep it on your television all day instead of, you know, whatever you have, a Cat picture videos. of a fuel log <laughs> or, a, yeah, or a, fish t a picture of a fish tank, a film, a movie of a fish tank. Check out uh, International Space Station above. And then an outpost on Mars. I would go there in a second, well, two years or whatever. <laughs> uh, this would be like an outpost in Antarctica. And this will be a good thing to finish up on because we're in California. Does everybody know the state motto of California? Eureka, I found it. So these European guys come over the hill and there's salmon coming up the Sacramento River, river longer than your arm, right? Because of previous people, their orange trees are like weeds. And it gets so out of hand, it got so out of hand, the rocks are made of gold. <laughs> like, that's how crazy it was. I found it. This is so great. Let's move to California. Okay, when you go to Mars, it is not like that. <laughs> and this romantic idea, I want to go live on Mars, and I'm going to retire on Mars, I'm going to die on Mars. Dude, you will die on Mars. <laughs> You open the spacecraft door right away, you'll notice I can't breathe. Yeah, so <laughs> if you really want a colony on Mars, go to Antarctica, the dry valleys, not the shore where the birds are swimming and the, the krill and the whales and stuff. Go over there, it hasn't rained or snowed in over a century, and on a summer day at noon, it's 20 below. And do that for a couple years and take all the scuba tanks you need to breathe for two years and see what you think. <laughs> However, a scientific outpost on Mars to look for signs of life, that could, dare I say it, change the world! <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Michael. That was great. Thank you for coming.